Hi, everyone. I am Lori Ann. I am the host of Bleepalimia. And today I'm so pleased to have Josie Warren with me. She is a chronic illness expert with a really great story. Really glad that you can make it on here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori Ann, for having me. And so uh, excited to be here to share with the Beat Bulimia audience out there. Um, appreciate you all. Beautiful. So let's start with, tell us a little bit about yourself and what your story is. Yeah. Um, so currently I am a chronic illness expert and I do the work I do because I had a history of autoimmune disorders and chronic illnesses. And one of those was bulimia and it truly ruled my life. And I am seven years completely resolved of all of my autoimmune chronic illnesses, including bulimia and uh, alcoholism and other issues that I'll share about that I had uh, that were actually all related and coming from the same place. And so um, it is wonderful to be able to share about my bulimia experience and uh, story into fully healing because I want listeners out there to know there is a way and it isn't something that we have to hide or struggle with for the rest of our lives. Um, I thought I was going to have a, be a lifelong bulimic um, and it was going to be the thing that would be my unraveling. Um, and it doesn't have to be so happy to I'm excited to share about that today. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, how long did you struggle with this? It's a great question. I first started throwing up probably around 12 years old. Yeah, I would wow. say it was about 12, seventh grade. Um, I think it was about 12, but it really kicked into full gear um, when I was about 17 in high school. And it was a little over a decade of very heavy bulimia um, daily, usually anywhere from three to maybe if, you know, on a harder day of the week, maybe seven times a day, as we all know, we have those harder days. So it was a daily occurrence for me for well over a decade. Wow. Yeah. Those are very exhausting days. Exactly. Yeah. The days <laughs> yeah. where, where I wore myself out so yes. much internally and physically that after that episode, all I can do is go to bed or fall into bed or kind of in a, almost a coma state that I know I put myself into after doing such harm and to my internal self in those episodes. Which leads to a great question. Um, in your uh, opinion, why? Why do we do this to ourselves? I'm so glad you asked that, Lori Ann, because, you know, if I'm honest, uh, if you would have asked me that question years ago, I would have definitively said, you know what? It was my family. Um, I come from a history of bulimia. Uh, my grandma, she's still alive. She's 91. She's bulimic. Uh, my mom's bulimic. My dad had an eating, pro an eating disorder. And so it just kind of, you know, all behind closed doors. No one talks about it as is most families. But I just thought, well, I'm faded too. <laughs> That's my, and I would have said it was because of my family, but in the understanding that I've gained in the years that I've been resolved of it, I can now see that I chose bulimia. It didn't choose me that, you know, um, at that young age, I had kind of a buffet of self-harm options that I could have chosen from. And I picked the one that no one could see. I picked I picked bulimia because I knew that I could hide it. Um, unlike some of my friends who might have, you know, cutting um, or maybe even anorexia, which I did struggle with too from time to time, which is, is much more visible. Bulimia was something that I could do that was internal, that was secret to me, that was internal self-harm. And most importantly, I could literally hide it behind a closed door. And no one had to know about it. No one had to see. It was just me destroying myself and my internal self because that was how bad I felt about myself on the inside. And so to that, because I have to say that I didn't feel myself horrible about myself. It, it's a weird thing. Yeah. But I was more worried about what other people thought. And when I looked 
myself in the mirror, I was okay. But when I looked from the other people looking at me, I had this distorted view that I was not good enough. So it wasn't about, because even today, like I'm much better now and I don't care what people think, but that was a big part of it was that it wasn't that I hated myself. I hated how I saw other people see me. Does that Mm. make any sense? No, that, yeah, that does make sense to me is from my experience, I too, I, I thought that everyone saw me through this totally distorted lens. Here I was, you know, you know, cute, all American girl, you know, athletic, had all the things that you would think that someone would ever want. I had, could, didn't want for anything and had great friends, went to a good school, was smart, but I thought that people saw me in this completely different light that I was almost like an ogre or so, um, so rejected, so ugly, so not accepted. And and from my Mm. experience, that that kind of projection that I had that other people were having about me was actually just how I was really feeling about myself deep down, that underneath the, they think this about me, my experience, I could see, oh, that's just how I felt about me. And it makes me kind of sad to think little me felt so, so, so sad and so awful about myself at that age um, to, to, to do something like that to myself. But here, you know, we, that's what we do. That's perfect. I love the way that you turned that around. I said, I love myself. I didn't like how other people saw me, but no, actually that was likely how I did see myself subconsciously somewhere in my life. So very well said. Yes. Like that. So what inspired you to move forward to make the changes? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I mean, like I had shared earlier, I really thought that my bulimia was just going to be something that was going to be lifelong. I did not see a way out of it. Um, I actually became a, a therapist, a licensed professional counselor, and I would buy um, like ble- bulimia treatment books and things that you might use with a client. I would actually buy them for myself, trying to see if I could find a way out for myself. And it, I could find no light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I saw a a therapist for my bulimia and of course, uh, I'm going to say like a lot of us, but I was, I hid it from her. She thought I was totally recovered and and I still knew I was doing it. And so it was kind of a wash there. Told my mom finally had the mother daughter talk, you know, not a lot came of that and kind of coinciding with my progression of my bulimia um, was the the degrading of my health, um, mm-hmm. my chronic health conditions. So as my bulimia progressed, um, I also had a addiction to alcohol, which in my experience, they're almost exactly the same kind of compulsion um, in my brain that was happening there. And I was also developing conditions like arthritis, uh, thyroid autoimmune disorder called Hashimoto's, lupus. Um, and I was actually starting to develop um, early stages of MS as well, along with just a few other kinds of autoimmune disorders. And so while my bulimia was a daily thing that was always running in the background, that was truly controlling my life, my health problems, my chronic health conditions were keeping me from being able to get out into the, the career world and be the kind of therapist and be the kind of uh, you know woman in my mid twenties that I wanted to be And so it was actually my, interestingly enough, it was my autoimmune disorders that was the thing that actually allowed me to resolve my bulimia. So my autoimmune disorders got so bad that I had to quit my career. Um, I was working at the Betty Ford Center, um, alcohol and drug treatment. And so when you quit that, where did you go from there? Yeah. Well, I thought I, it's funny. I thought that my stressful therapy career was what was causing my health conditions. And interestingly enough, when I quit my therapy career, my health conditions didn't go away. They actually started to progress. So I got pretty scared there and thought, well, I have a lot of free time now to figure myself out. Let me see what I can do. Because for me, 
the avenues of therapy. And again, I was a therapist, but seeing my own therapist, um, you know, doing alternative treatments and Western medicine it was not working for me in any of the conditions that I had. And I just felt like a basket case. So I came across um, a practitioner who told me about an organization here in Denver, Colorado, in the United States. Um, it's called a New Life Center. And she said, hey, you might want to give them a call. They have they help people like you who doctors don't have a solution for and not working, (laughs) kind of having left my career and having no prospects of my future and, you know, being bulimic, being an alcoholic and having eight autoimmune disorders. I thought, well, maybe I'll give them a ring. Um, So I called them up and they happened to be doing a two year clinical study for people with chronic health conditions. And with everything I had going on, I fit the bill, but I truly came in for my autoimmune for my Hashimoto's for the MS for those things. And I entered into their program. Um, and it was just an educational program and it blew my mind because what they were teaching was that chronic stress was the root cause of all my conditions. And, and I thought, well, that's interesting. I said, well, I know I'm, I'm kind of stressed, but how am I more stressed than the average person? And what does that have to do with my health? And what I learned through them was that my body had gotten overloaded through my lifetime with suppressed stress, which I could say, absolutely. And I know anybody out there with bulimia, we're all kind of cut from the same cloth. We're people who had a lot of stressors in our life, you know, issues with parents, like my dad passed away, maybe moves, heartbreaks, you know, parental substance abuse or divorce, we suppressed all of it unconsciously. And what I found is that over time, my body couldn't handle that anymore, suppressed stress, and it tipped over into a nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system. And the problem that was going on with me and my body malfunctioning with my autoimmune and my compulsive uh, chronic conditions like bulimia and alcoholism with my brain chemistry being all off was simply that my body was stuck in the sympathetic and stuck in a state of fight or flight where it couldn't heal and self-repair. And that resonated with me. I said, you know, yeah, I, I have had a lot of stressors. I haven't dealt with them, truly. I know they're still lodged in the body somewhere. And I do feel like I'm in kind of a fight or flight state all the time. No wonder I'm not getting better. And so I they taught me a new perspective of life and stress. And so that the life I had suddenly didn't feel so chronically stressful. And I felt like I got, got some really good tools for how to handle and manage my life that no one had taught just very practical tools for how to do life. And in that my body picked up on that and turned off fight or flight entered into the parasympathetic nervous system, which is where our body regains homeostasis and my immune system went back to normal. So all my immune disorders went away, but this magical thing happened that I did not anticipate. I tell you what, Lorianne, I did not go here for my bulimia at all, but when my body went back into homeostasis, my brain chemistry went back to normal levels as well. And that compulsion to throw up that I had, that almost addiction I had to, to, to throwing up, to puking the addiction I had even to alcohol resolved as well. And I no longer had the need to engage in the binging and engage in the the puking. It was not physically like in my brain chemistry anymore to do so. And it blew my mind. It blew my mind because I mean, it was wonderful. No, get me wrong. Wonderful to resolve my autoimmune disorders. That's something doctors say is impossible. So it was great to do that. But honestly, the, the biggest cherry on top was that it resolved my bulimia. And it's almost like I couldn't if I tried. It truly doesn't exist in me. And it's so, I'm so grateful because I would go through these periods as I know many do, or we're kind of on and off the wagon, you know, I'd be good, what I'd call good for 
weeks or even a number of months, but I always knew that there would be some stressor that would trigger me. Something would happen and I would go back to my old patterns, find the next toilet and be right back there all over again. And it would happen all, it happened throughout my whole time with bulimia, it always on and off, on and off the wagon and how defeating that was. So to know that there's no wagon for me to even be on or off anymore is truly incredible. And honestly, I can't believe how resilient my body is. Once it entered into that parasympathetic state and healed and self-repaired, I don't have any real long-term damage other than my teeth. Um, and I'm actually very thankful for that. I mean, I do have, you know, in the backs, uh, worn enamel, yeah. you know, and I had to be honest yeah. with my dentist. Finally, I was like, yeah, I was bulimic in the past. That's why that happened. Um, but interesting. That you say that because I remember my dentist used to say, "Do you drink a lot of orange juice?" Yeah, lemon <laughs> oh, juice. Yes. I've heard. <laughs> yeah. Do sure. you have acid reflux? <laughs> oh, I know. Yes. I did. I made up a whole story to my dentist that I had this acid oh. reflux problem, and they were so concerned about my acid reflux, and it all behind closed doors. I completely but they knew. were giving me the excuses, so it was like, yes, yeah. yes, until I came clear like mm. you and then it was like hey no you know what all those lies I told you I was bulimic for 30 30 years so yeah and uh again like you if that's the worst that happened to me that's I'm blessed right yeah that yeah uh interesting about the fight or flight too because really that to me was all about my bulimia is that I I didn't like to fight so me it was mm -hmm. all the flight but you know you'd be eating that you want to fight emotion <laughs> yeah. and then your flight was the release of it mm. uh and it's wonderful when you say to move to the next part where you don't have that anymore you I know it's it. like it's wow gone. what a what a relief i it was funny too because the stress thing um i understand completely a lot of times we don't even know that we're stressed i was going through a period where and even through my recovery through uh, COVID where mm. I would get tummy knots and it would just be like, and I never, like, that was the nice part about it. Bulimia never came to mind, but mm. I was having those fight and flights and I couldn't figure out what they were. They were resolved and I really can't tell you how, but <laughs> I moved yeah. in with my parents. I have people around me and it just felt like that's probably what I needed was I was so alone all the time mm. we don't know sometimes what can cause those feelings of stress like that is one thing that i'm curious about how did you move because those are hard sometimes to yes recognize really seriously yeah that was, thank you it, it was it, it, it's you know our society talks about stress as this very big concept. And it's like, well, how in the world do I handle my life in stress? How do I get this under control? So my body, my brain chemistry can go back to normal. My body can get out of fight or flight. Like it's kind of the age old question. And mm -hmm. what I learned, I kind of three things that I learned was the first thing I had to learn, which is a, was really good for me was that the things that had happened in my life that I considered big stressors, you know, like losing a parent, um, you know, challenges in my upbringing and with my family and uh, heartbreaks and things of that nature, that these were not unique stressors. I thought that my life was harder than everybody else's and my stress was worse and my parents were even more worse than the next person. And, and I had to start to see this new perspective of no, Josie. You were to put a hundred people in a room and ask them what stressors they've had in their life. We're all going to have a lot of the same ones that in a good way, I was not special and I was not unique. And thankfully I wasn't and no, and no one really is so that we know that we can actually deal with our stress because I was making my things so big that it made it impossible for me to overcome and thus would always get st stay stuck with my bulimia in that sympathetic nervous system fight or flight place. Um, so first was realizing, oh, stress is a experience that everyone has. And we all have a lot of the same stressors, you know, and I'm not special in a good way. 
And then the second piece, which was really helpful for me, kind of blew, turned everything upside down for me, was to start to realize, and that's what I learned here at a new life center, was that stress is an internal experience. And what that means is that my stress comes from inside of me. It's created inside of me. No, no one and no thing gives me stress. And I was baffled by that. I thought, well, that can't be right. There has to be, you know, things are stressful. Things are. And so my mentor used a great example of, of flying on an airplane. He said, listen, let's look at the different kinds of responses people have to the same stimuli. And I thought about it and I said, okay, yeah, like I have a friend who doesn't fly because she has such a stress response Uh, or people like my grandma who might take medication because it's so stressful to them. Or there might be people like my sister who is more comfortable in the air than she is on land. So (laughs) if the airplane ride was giving us, giving us stress, wouldn't we all have that same stress experience? The fact that we all have different experiences to the same events or siblings, right? Having different experiences to the same event growing up. All that told me was definitively my stress is coming from me. And why that's so key, Lorianne, is because if it's coming from us, then there's actually something we can do about it. Now, yes. which is to me, it was like mind blowing because if it was coming from my past, if it was given to me by my parents or by my relationship or by my boss, then I'm powerless. That's out of my control. But if I know it's hundred percent coming from inside of me, then I know that I can do something about it and I can change. And so I had to realize that. And then kind of that final piece to wrap it like all up of what I did was I had to realize, okay, how do I deal with stress? How do I change my internal experience? And I had to realize that I did not have something called resilience. I was not having strong resilience in my life. Um, And resilience is the solution to stress, to our internal stress. It's our ability to be adaptive to life. It's my ability to be adaptive and to bounce back in times of life. And if you would have asked me when I had bulimia, if I was resilient, I would say, of course I am. I've been through this and this and this, you know, a warrior, I'm a survivor. And I could, looking at it again, I was honesty, I said, oh, well, you you got through those things, but was it pretty? (laughs) You got, you know, you made it, made it through things, but I could see in my history, I was running away from stressors. I was burying my head in the sand. I was hiding. I mean, talk about bulimia. Talk about a, a hiding disease. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's all behind closed doors. You know, that dual life that we have, that addiction I had to that kind of dual, uh, dual life of, you know, here I am and here I am behind closed doors. I mean, it, the whole thing was hiding. And so I could see that while as humans, resilience is inherent to us. It's why we are the dominant species. That's why we are, you know, we survived when others, when, you know, other species didn't is because our ancestors ability to be adaptive and to bounce back and to find that water or to fight off that predator or to, you know, make the fire. Our modern world doesn't need us to be very resilient because it's so everything's right here. So my resilience had gone weak. And so that kind of to resolve my experience of stress, I had to realize I had to change And I had to look at life as a place to grow and learn and to put myself back out into life to grow and to learn and to put myself into situations and things that I would have hidden from in the past and kind of get out of hiding because I was hiding for all those years with my, you know, my food addictions and my alcoholism and my eating, you know, problems and my autoimmune. I had to get out the house and get out the front door and start to use life to grow my internal strength and grow my resilience. You know, I couldn't be resilient if I was hiding. So I got back out into life in small ways, you know, small and more medium sized ways. And I started to realize, oh, I can do this. And I would fall down and, but I'd pick myself back up and 
becoming stronger and stronger. And that was my ability to learn how to do life and do handle life and stress. And my body picked up on that, got out of the sympathetic, turned off fight or flight. And I have been resolved ever since by just activating my natural resilience and using life as an opportunity to grow and to learn. Love it. Actually, that's one of my favorite songs. I get knocked down, but I get up again. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Chumba Wumba. I was one of my favorite too. That's a great one. Yeah. Oh, I had the album. Beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, definitely one of those. Um, and interesting that you just mentioned that because um, we we're talking through COVID and it's about getting back out there again. And we're just yes. kind of weird because when I was saying my stressor, I got out, I moved in with my parents, helping them out. They're helping me by doing that too, because I'm yeah. around them. But the other thing too is getting out because I was two years at home alone. I live alone. And you could see that that could do that. It's getting out. Once I started getting out, my stress level dropped significantly and interacting with other people. Um, I know that has nothing to do with bulimia, but there were a lot, there were a few people who actually um, started to engage in bulimia during COVID. And that oh, of makes it more understanding because that stress, because of, mm -hmm. you know, being seriously, we were locked down. Literally locked. <laughs> Yeah, literally and, locked down. It's a recipe for, yeah. you know, eating disorder, chronic illness, disaster oh, is yeah. being closed in, not getting out in life and suppressing all of that stress and that experience. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, and luckily, like I said, um, having gotten to the point where, you know, I had had enough years behind my belt to, <laughs> to be recovered from bulimia. But had I not, that probably would have triggered it again at some point. But to me, I can't even, I can't even imagine. And sometimes I understand, I go, I don't even know why I ever did it. I do know, but I don't know because my mindset is so different now. Yeah. That is a strange thing to think, wow, you did that. You know, it's like almost it's, a different world. It, it I don't is. know if that's with you, but it just does feel like that with me. It is. And if you'd be open to this, Lorianne, I had an awareness about my bulimia even more recently about why I did it, that I was kind of like, oh, I did not want to admit that to anybody. But it it was truly the kind of there was the hiding aspect, but there was this other side that I never really shared with anyone. And it, would that be OK if I absolutely if I shared please. that? <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Maybe some of the listeners can relate because it's, you know. I had this cover, I guess you could say, like for many years of like, oh, I'm bulimic because I'm trying to stay this certain weight or I'm bulimic because my body image is so poor or because of what other people say. And, and those, not that those things were not true, but if I were to really go a little bit deeper underneath the surface, what I realized, I mean, when I had bulimia and I know, you know, I'm sure you can relate and the listeners can, it was a, it was a, very tangible brain chemistry imbalance. It was a compulsion mm -hmm. that I had. It was an addiction. And I could see I was addicted to the Jekyll and Hyde that bulimia gave me. I was mm -hmm. addicted to that dual person that I could, here I was, I was this, had a secret life. I was this person on the outside that, you know, fit and all, you know, all American, smart, you know, the guys liked and the girls wanted to be friends with. And that's who I wanted to be. I really wanted to portray that kind of person. And I had these friends and this whole life. And then behind the scenes that I had this big secret that no one knew that actually I was also this dark person that did this nasty behavior that was putrid and gross and kind of disgusting and harmed me in all kinds of ways. And I got addicted to that double life that I led. I was truly addicted to the double life. There was a high that I got off of that. And I kind of, I, I liked or almost loved that duping everyone that I was doing. Here I was, they thought I was this person. But actually, I was also this person and only I knew that. And that was a drop. The, 
the, the main driving force for my bulimia for that whole decade underneath the weight and the scales and the, you know, the food in, food out, grocery store, stealing food, binging, the whole thing that I know we all know about. But underneath that, it was, it was an addiction to the dual life that I led. That's very interesting. That is actually very interesting. I uh, have to think about that one. Um, Because for me, whenever I was being bulimic, there is, I guess, some sort of element of excitement that you're hiding something that no one can take away from you. But then there was also that when I would see the reflection in the water, it was Mm -hmm. very disturbing for me. I'm thinking, what are you doing? Yeah. So there's the shame. I was almost wallowing in my own shame because um, maybe I felt I didn't deserve all the things I was, because I didn't have a bad life either. <laughs> maybe, you know, I don't know. Um, there's so many elements to it, but uh, so happy to hear that, you know, and that you're sharing. Uh, definitely, there is full recovery uh, for anyone yeah. who thinks that there isn't. There absolutely is. And it definitely is like a different world once you get to that side where you go, wow, you know, why did I do it? Yeah, I know, but why? <laughs> like, you know, you talk to your younger self and go, I don't know I would if I would change anything, weirdly enough, because yeah. I love my life. And people go, you know, go back. Uh, they've got the red door and the blue door. Red door, go back and fix your mistakes. Mm-hmm. Blue door, you've got $10 million. Well, I don't need $10 million, but that's the one I would take anyway, because <laughs> I don't need to fix the past. I've learned from it and I'm moving forward. So it sounds like definitely you've got a lot to help other people with. I love that you wrote down. I was reading your profile and, um, you know, seven years recovered uh, that you want to be a beacon of light to show the world that there is another way uh, that the healing is possible. And that's very beautifully written. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you, Lorian. So thank you so much for being here as a guest. Is there any way people could reach out to you or you yeah yeah you thank that? you yeah i would love just all the listeners out there i've been in your shoes and i know i know the struggle and the secretness of, you know the hiding the addiction part of it the compulsion the like why am i this person this is not who i want to be and i just want you all to know out there that you can actually resolve it that it doesn't have to be lifelong and you can actually not have it anymore and not have to worry about it coming back down the road and don't have to worry about your, you know, developing another kind of eating disorder. And so what I do and kind of what I specialize in is my own personal healing and recovery, um, you know, resolution really of all my autoimmune and my bulimia and my alcoholism. It inspired me and saved my life so that I now work at a new life center and I work at the organization that I came to And I want you all to know that I work with people just like you, just like I was um, with chronic illnesses, such as bulimia, um, such as autoimmune, such as chronic pain, um, because they're all coming from the same place. And so my specialty um, right now, I'm known as the Hashimoto's expert. That's an autoimmune. So I'll give you my contact information for that. But I want you to know that the work I do works just as well with bulimia or any kinds of other eating disorders. Um, And you can find me at my website, which is www.thehashimotosexpert. And I'll spell that out. Um, That's T-H-E-H-A-S-H-I-M-O-T-O-S-E-X-P-E-R-T.com. And you can find me, um, reach out to me if you have any questions, want to connect or you know, liked what I shared. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, my email is Josie and that's J O S I E at the Hashimoto's fix. That's T H E H A S H I M O T O S F I X.com. And you can find me there. And I just know that I'm here for you. There is a way out and I am living today because of it. So, um, yeah, thinking of you all, my heart goes out to your experience right now beautiful thank you so much for being a guest and to my listeners uh all that information will also be in the notes so you can uh head over there and reach out to Josie Josie it was just wonderful having you as a guest thank you thank you so much for your time thank you Lori and thank you for all that you do this podcast is very important 
Thank, Thank you, you for having it. Thank you. Great day.